So, um, what is blended learning is, is the topic that I'll talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, as you uh, can probably imagine, it's a fairly expansive topic, uh, lots to, to talk about. And I'm hoping to just frame it a little bit for us uh, going forward, just try to hit on some, some key points um, uh, that'll hopefully help us uh, through the series. Um, and this is, this is the plan. I'll talk about uh, what it is and look at uh, f essentially four different uh, definitions uh, of blended learning. Um, and then briefly talk about, that'll sort of be the bulk of it, the definitions there briefly talk about why you would want to do uh, blended learning. Um, some challenges, uh, things to, to watch for uh, when you do it, uh, and then uh, finish it with a little uh, example uh, of uh, a blend, uh, which I think is an interesting example of it. So that's kind of the plan. So the, the first definition um, is a very broad one. I'm sort of starting with a very general definition and trying to get a little more specific. Um, and some of the literature uh, uh, will argue that all learning is essentially uh, blended learning, right? So different types of pedagogies and technologies and instructional modalities and uh, all sorts of things is, is blended learning. And it's hard to sort of argue uh, with that, um, except for that it's maybe a bit too, too broad, and we kind of want to focus in on, uh, on certain uh, aspects of it. Um, and, and definitely for, for our purposes here, uh, this is kind of casting the net a bit too uh, wide. Uh, we want to get uh, a bit more specific. So if we go to uh, another one, and this one is maybe more recognizable to you, uh, this combination of face-to-face, F2F, uh, and non-face-to-face -face activities, uh, particularly face-to-face um, uh, -face classroom with online uh, participation uh, or an extension of that. So I think we're getting a little bit closer to what most people uh, think of as, as, as blended learning. So for example, um, Blackboard, you have a face-to-face -face class, and you use Blackboard to sort of extend that. Maybe you put up some files, or you put up some links, um, do some assessments. Uh, maybe you use, so that would be the, the asynchronous example. Maybe you use something like Blackboard Collaborate, which is the webinar platform, uh, where you bring in more synchronous online meetings, uh, real-time meetings. Um, maybe remote students or bring in guest lecturers for your uh, classroom students, things like that. Um, so just to show you that that, if, if we're looking at that as a definition of, of blended learning, we are actually quite engaged here at Dow already. Um, these are some of the latest stats from Blackboard. Um, just from, from last week. And you can see that there are over 1,100 course spaces uh, on Blackboard this term. Um, and maybe the truer number, there's over 1,600 CRNs uh, in the system, so sort of true courses in, in the system already. Uh, almost 15,000 students have at least one class in, in Blackboard. Um, so I don't know exactly how many courses we have this term, but I'm guessing that it's close to like 90% coverage there with, uh, with Blackboard uh, in, in the university. Again, that's a bit of a guess, but it's pretty high. A high number of, of classes uh, are, are using Blackboard. Okay. Um, so I know that some people in would disagree that this is actually true blended learning. In fact, I know that some people in this room <laughs> I would say that a lot of this is sort of fairly basic use of, uh, of the non-face-to-face -face stuff or the online uh, stuff. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll get to that uh, in the next slide. Certainly there are a lot of instructors, uh, some I know in this room, that are using it uh, much more uh, 
uh, in much more advanced ways. But by and large, it's fairly basic use of, of the system. And to, to illustrate what, what I mean uh, with that, um, I don't know if you've heard of David Wiley, but he's one of the more progressive uh, voices in online education. I think he's based out of BYU. Um, and he's especially one of the leaders in this uh, open education uh, movement. Um, and he wrote a paper a while ago that talked about, well, here, I'll read it. The LMS, LMS stands for Learning Management System, which is Blackboard, right? Is focused primarily on helping teachers increase the efficiency of the administrative tasks of instruction. And he gives some, some examples there. So he, his argument is that something like Blackboard is largely used for administrative use uh, as opposed to enhancing learning, right? Um, and I can tell you, working fairly closely to that, the Blackboard situation in the last couple of years, that that is probably fairly accurate here at Dal as well. Most uh, faculty use it uh, for administrative tasks, essentially putting up files, putting up links, using it to distribute grades, uh, communication, these kinds of things, right? Um, not to say that's a bad thing, because it can, it can do that, those kinds of things very, very well, right? But we um, are, in this workshop, part of our goal is to kind of get you in the direction that goes beyond that a little bit, okay? So bringing us to another definition uh, here, which was part of that, I don't know if you guys did your homework, <laughs> read the Cohare report, uh, which was a report uh, uh, across a number of universities here in Canada uh, that looked at their blended learning uh, situations. And they say that, or they give a definition, or one of the definitions they give is the thoughtful integration of face-to-face -face and online. So we have these sort of two new words here, thoughtful integration. Right, um, which is really sort of getting closer to what we are hoping to do uh, in uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, but this one, so it helps us kind of start to think about what is more important uh, with with blended learning. But it's still uh, kind of vague, right? What is thoughtful uh, integration? So. The, the fourth one, the last one that I'll look at here, uh, is uh, starts to get into a, a little more uh, a little more detail. I think it's uh, getting us uh, closer to how the three of us would kind of like to frame the, the conversation here about about blended learning. Um, and I'll just read it for you here. Blended learning refers to enriched student-centered learning experiences made possible by the harmonious integration of various strategies achieved by com uh, combining face-to-face -face interaction with ICTs, so information and communication technologies, uh, computer stuff, essentially. Um, maybe goes a little broader than on the online world. Uh, uh, maybe includes stuff like classroom technologies, clickers, cell phones, these kinds of things as well. Okay, um, so in, in this one we see there's a certain focus on, uh, on uh, particular words here, especially learning experiences or student learning experiences. Um, so the, the emphasis uh, with this definition is that we're trying to get students uh, sort of more meaningfully engaged in the learning, right, hopefully resulting in some kind of deeper uh, deeper learning, right? Um, and then there's this uh, idea of uh, integration, uh, which is a harmonious integration of these two face-to-face uh, -face and non-face-to-face -face, um, aspects. So really thinking about how they connect, right? How something you do online, for example, connects to what you do in the classroom and hopefully framed by some uh, broader outcomes that we're thinking about that we'll talk about uh, later, okay? Um, so with this definition, there's more of an emphasis on the, the pedagogy. You're really sort of starting to think about uh, the, the learning. Um, 
so I, I hope that gives you some or starts to frame it a little bit uh, on how or on what we would like to, to do uh, for the, this series. So to talk about why now, um, this when I was reading up on and preparing for this thing, this is one sentence that really kind of struck me. So I wanted to put it up here uh, because this swale, I don't know if it's a, a man or a woman, but they talk about how uh, the rules are changing. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing to, to think about. I don't think, um, I don't think they talk about, or I don't think they mean that, I mean, it might be a bit of an exaggeration, right? Talking about how higher ed needs to evolve and adapt or, or desist. I mean, it's pretty, uh, it might be exaggerated. Uh, but the, the idea itself, I think, is, is one to, uh, worth thinking about, especially when you think about technology and how that is sort of changing almost sort of exponentially, right? And how that can, I mean, it's affecting everything, but obviously it's bound to affect education as well. Um, and they, in, in this article, they sort of make a connection to uh, the some knowledge society, that we're becoming more of a knowledge society now, and that blended learning offers some promise for how to sort of meet that, that challenge and that, that change, okay? So, I don't know, the rules are changing? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. So to continue the, the why of it, I'll just sort of uh, go over the, the three there, but um, there, there are a few more reasons. I've highlighted the three that I think are, are uh, three of the more important ones. Definitely the flexibility aspect of it and the accessibility uh, uh, aspect of it is huge, right? This anywhere, anytime uh, uh, quality of it, right? Uh, students can... Uh, access it to, from anywhere, all the time. That's definitely a big component. Um, interaction and engagement is also huge. This idea that we're, we can now sort of extend the, the classroom out uh, into the online world where students can sort of continue to interact at any time, uh, collaborate with each other, um, uh, even uh, from remote locations. This idea is uh, obviously a big one why we'd want to uh, start thinking about blended learning. And then the last one, uh, a lot of the literature uh, does uh, sort of point to the fact that, well, it does make a difference in the learning and the teaching that happens, that the, the outcomes are, um, are being met more successfully in a blended environment. Um, so those, those are three big ones that I'd like to, to highlight why you'd want to start uh, doing this. Uh, but there's a, there's a few, uh, few others there that I think are also um, uh, worth, uh, worth looking at, at. Business case even, right? Uh, it's often uh, can be, if it's done properly, uh, sort of more efficient uh, from a business perspective as well. Okay. This is a quote that I, I like as well. It, um, comes from this uh, website out there called the Blended Learning Toolkit, right? And uh, I think this is a quote from a faculty, a social work, I can't remember, maybe a state, uh, uh, university in Florida. She says, students in my traditional courses come to class like baby <coughs> birds with their mouths open for food. In my blended courses, or my blended course, students come in prepared and actively contribute to class, right? So that's kind of an interesting uh, idea as well. So they can, if you have that stuff out there before, they can look, they can prepare, and they can come in and uh, engage uh, more uh, inside the classroom, in the face-to-face -face class. Now some of the, some of the challenges to, to think about, um, definitely workload uh, is something uh, to think about, both from an instructor perspective and a student perspective. So, from a, uh, for an instructor, developing these these kinds of uh, online activities and online presence is not easy. It takes it takes quite a bit of work, right? Um, and and then from the student perspective, sometimes we get into this trap where you have your normal face-to-face -face class, and then you're just sort of giving them 
more stuff to do online, right? So they they end up having to do more work, right? And so I've heard it described as this course and a half syndrome, right? Uh, so definitely something to, to, to watch. And it brings up a question that I think these guys are going to touch on later uh, about uh, whether we should be reducing the face-to-face -face time if we're doing more online stuff, right? So that's a, a big question uh, to start thinking about as well. Uh, insufficient support is often a problem uh, at uh, institutions, whether that's tech support or whether it's uh, pedagogical support, um, often that stuff is just not there uh, for uh, instructors. And then this idea of uh, doing uh, technology uh, for technology's sake to be cool or uh, to keep up, whatever, and not really think about uh, the, the learning side of it. The, you're just thinking about the bells and whistles uh, of the, the technology. So that, I've seen that quite a bit as well, and that's something to to think about, do I really need to do this, right? Uh, that's an important one. Um, and so there's there's uh, there's some others there. Students like the face-to-face, -face, right? That last one, the uh, uh, sometimes students don't like to go from passive to, to active. Uh, I've experienced personally as a student uh, when I Take on, I took uh, an online a degree that was completely online from Athabasca, and I remember getting towards the end of my degree, and actually, because often the courses there that they would have uh, they have a lot of online discussion, so sometimes worth ten percent, twenty percent, forty percent of the course. And I remember by the end of it, I was looking at courses that had the lowest amount of participation, and and use that to decide almost uh, what course I wanted to take, right? Because th that online discussion requires a lot of work, right, to think about to your answers and type your answers, right? So that's potentially a, a, a challenge there. So to, to finish it, I just wanted to, to show you a, a video here, um, which so, some of you may have seen it. It's a bit, uh, it's been around for a couple years now. Um, and it is an experiment uh, on Twitter. Um, so uh, this uh, prof in the States is using Twitter in the classroom. Um, 